Hey folks, how are you? Good to see you. You guys know there's like about a five second delay, right? By the time I say something and it reaches you. Good to see all your beautiful faces, even though I'm not seeing your faces, I'm actually seeing your nicks. Good to see your beautiful nicks. We see some regulars and some people who haven't been here for a while. Sa El Noom. I like his name. Sa El Noom. Guys, as you can see, I need to shave. Pray for me. These last two days, I was out of state. I was doing some recordings with El Fadi. We did an entire series on the Old Testament basis for the triunity of God. Trinity in the Hebrew Scriptures, right? Because if you follow El Fadi's YouTube channel, it's Sira International, C-I-R-A. Al Fadi is a precious brother in Jesus Christ. He's a gem. He's a gift to the church of Jesus Christ. And shame on me, I haven't mentioned him enough. It's not because I was trying to deliberately ignore him, but there's so many great apologists, so many great evangelists, so many great Bible teachers that God has raised up for the church of Jesus Christ that it's hard for me to remember all their names and mention them for you to pray, support, and encourage them. Subscribe to his YouTube channel at Sira International, C-I-R-A International. He's got some social media pages. If you guys don't know Al Fadi, he used to be a Muslim. He's from Saudi Arabia, born in Saudi Arabia. He used to be a Salafi and is in love with Jesus Christ, sold out for Jesus Christ. And he's even willing to die for Jesus Christ because he's putting himself out there in the public limelight limelight so let me take a moment to thank jesus christ praise praise jesus christ glorify jesus christ for someone like al fadi i also want to mention again this sister i've mentioned in the past in fact both sisters i've mentioned but if you guys are on my social media pages when i say social media facebook i don't have instagram right i just want to glorify jesus christ and praise jesus christ for these two women and notice, I want to glorify Jesus Christ and thank Jesus Christ. I want to glorify the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Why? Because everything good, everything delightful, everything beautiful, everything truthful, everything that is perfect is from the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if you have an outstanding evangelist or Bible teacher, that's the grace of the triune God, raising up such a teacher as a gift of his grace for the church of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, so I just want to take a moment, thank the Lord Jesus for Al Fadi, pray for his ministry, pray for his family, pray for his children, pray for his safety, praise Jesus for him, because if you go to his YouTube channel, and you guys probably already have subscribed, Sira, C-I-R-A, International, he not only facilitates apologist he brings in jay smith an outstanding brother praise god for jay smith and his devotion to the lord he brings in anthony rogers david and myself to do professional recordings the studio that we are at their ca their cameras are high definitional cameras the cameras are so good that you can actually see what you really look like and when i was looking at myself in those high def cameras i really wanted to throw myself out from the first floor window because I realized, thank Jesus, I'm losing weight and I pray I lose more weight because I'm still not there and I'm doing it very slowly. Pray I don't gain weight to get my health back if he wants me around, but more importantly, to be holy in love with Jesus, to be holy and pure, to delight Jesus's heart. Though I'm losing weight, my head is huge. My goodness. David Wood is not lying. If I want to lose 50 pounds of ugly fat, just chop off my head. My head is monstrous, man. Wow. Because I was in the studio yesterday and the day before. Honestly, when I'm in the studio, and you'll see it, by the way, we did a live stream for his Facebook page. And thank our brother, Revelation 2213. God bless him. And thank Psalm 23. Folks, let me give it a shout out. 
Revelation 22, 13, and Psalm 23. These are two outstanding Christian men who love Jesus or apologists who have YouTube channels. Subscribe to their YouTube channels because what they do is they take clips, they take our sessions, download them to their YouTube channels. So both Psalm 23 and Revelation 22, 13 posted the live streams I did with Al-Fadi yesterday. And I think I did one the day before. Yes, we did two live streams. Yesterday's live stream was Paul in the early Islamic sources. Paul in the early Islamic sources. So pray Jesus Christ for Psalm 23, Revelation 22, 13. I don't give you guys enough accolades. God bless you. We need more soldiers, more people actively involved in ministry on social media, on YouTube. So encourage them, pray for them, subscribe to their channels. We need to encourage one another. We need to build one, one another up, provided the men and women who are doing the work of the Lord are men and women of integrity who love Jesus. And I have watched them over the years, and I can say from what I've seen, they are men of integrity who love Jesus, and I thank God for them. Even Sa El Nom, he's another brother that I have watched over the years, and he too, I pray you know, that he's a man of integrity, and I see that he is. Like I said, I can only go by what I'm seeing on social media. If there's anyone who's a wolf in sheep's clothing, the Lord Jesus knows who he is and will expose him. So far, what I've seen is Revelation 22, 13, Psalm 23, and Sa El Nom. They all have YouTube channels. I have seen nothing but good from them, and I pray God will preserve them and all of us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I also ask the Lord Jesus to make the sound of my voice pleasing to your ears for his glory. Because, man, I cannot stand my voice. Now, with that said, I also want to take a moment. I also want to take a moment to praise two outstanding women. And I mean this from my heart. <clears throat> two outstanding women. And I said it on my Facebook pages. If there was a vote for Christian woman of the century, it would be a tie for these two sisters in the Lord. One of them is Marie Wood. Marie Wood, David Wood's wife. And I say this not because David was my brother in the Lord. He is. I love him. Though we banter back and forth, I love David Wood. Right? I love him. He's a soldier, and I praise Jesus Christ for him. I love Vocab Malone. I love that brother. I love Anthony Rogers. Edward Dalcor. I love that brother. I love <clears throat> John. What do you mean? I love that brother. Adam Coleman. You know, there's another brother you guys don't know. His name is Louis Lionheart. I love him. I love these brothers. And I truly count them my family. And I pray Christ will give me the grace that I will serve with them with integrity and also be willing to lay my life down for them because they're outstanding men of God. But Marie Wood is an amazing woman of faith. She exemplifies Proverbs 31. You don't know what she goes through on a daily basis with five handsome young lions. She's got five sons having to make sure they're taken care of, their needs are met spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. And she has two sons with particular challenges, trusting the Lord for a medical breakthrough to heal the mus muscular disorder they have so that their life will be prolonged on earth. I can tell you this. David Wood's great success, much of it is, because God has blessed them with an amazing woman. David Wood could not be who he is, could not do what he does, if he did not have such an amazing woman who is brilliant intellectually. She also is brilliant. She's an, a brilliant philosopher and apologist, right? She hasn't been able to do as much because she's busy taking care of her household. But she's brilliant. She has a brilliant mind, loves Jesus, godly woman who respects her husband. He really really has been blessed and graced with a Proverbs 31 wife, Marie Wood. And the other sister, and I don't even think there are men spiritually enough that could even be on her level. It would be very hard for this young lady if she wants to get married. And from what I see, she is content with celibacy. But if she were to find someone, I really don't know of anyone out there who's on her level spiritually who is as fearless as her, and I'm talking about men, Hatun Tash, Andrew Martin said it, Hatun Tash, Revelation 22, 13. She is a soldier's soldier. You may not hear about it, 
but she gets regularly beaten up by Muslim men. She's been attacked at least four times physically, physically beaten, physically. And yet she comes back stronger. <clears throat> she comes back more determined to preach Christ crucified, expose Islam, even if it means she'll be killed for it. Right? I really don't know if any man spiritually is on her level. She's amazing. Right? She's amazing. And you guys can tell I got a big head and narrow shoulders. I pray I can get my health and be aesthetically pleasing in Jesus' name. She's amazing. Hatun Tash. Yes, Terp. Her, her YouTube channel is DCCI Ministries. Is the sound good, guys? Everything good? Well, Chaldean, if you're in the USA and if you truly had a dream from Jesus, because I don't doubt. One thing about me, I do believe Jesus Christ our Lord can speak in dreams and visions, but not everyone who says he had a dream and vision from the Lord truly had one, but I don't have any reason why to doubt you. But we need to stay in contact. Hopefully God can use me to bless you to become a soldier of Christ. Anyway, so these are some amazing people of faith. These are people who are truly amazing gifts for the church of Jesus Christ. Pray for them, love them, support them, right? No, Vine, we don't have a speaker's corner. Not that I'm aware of, right? Speaker's corner. People don't know that speaker's corner is a free speech zone. I don't know if you know this. I just, In fact, I just realized this recently. Do you know that the things you say in speaker's corner, you cannot say once you leave speaker's corner, you can be arrested? Did you know that? I didn't even know this. I just found this out recently. If I had heard about it in the past, I didn't pay much attention to it. But Jay Smith and someone else confirmed that in Speaker's Corner, it's a free speech zone. There, you can say what you want. You can even say Muhammad is a pedophile. The moment you leave Speaker's Corner, you can't say that or you will be thrown in jail. Isn't it amazing? Once you leave that section, you can't say the things you say once you're there. Right? I didn't know this. So that means if I'm in the UK and I'm not in Speaker's Corner, I say Muhammad is an antichrist, a pedophile, or homosexuality is a disease, and it's an abomination to the Lord, I can go to jail. Yep. So, so you learn... You know, you learn things every day. So that said, let's ask the Lord to bless the session because we're going to get into Christmas. Right? And Christmas. We love you, Father. We praise you. We worship you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we worship you. You are the Father's heart. His word become flesh. We love you, Holy Spirit. We're in love with you, Holy Spirit. We praise you. We worship you. Truly, I say this. Holy Spirit, without you. We cannot live, we cannot breathe, and we cannot serve Jesus Christ. We need you more than we even realize, Holy Spirit. I need you. So, Holy Spirit, please take over this session, and not just this session. Take over every one of us. And I know that I pray on behalf of everyone here. Holy Spirit, we submit to you completely. Own us completely. Possess us completely. Fill us completely with your presence, with your love, with your joy, with your peace, and crucify our flesh. Destroy our flesh and save us from the stains of our flesh and not to succumb to the flesh. And Holy Spirit, seal us for Jesus. Because Jesus Christ, our Lord, said that you will glorify him and you will do so through us. Seal us for Jesus and use our mouths to glorify Jesus and our bodies to honor Jesus and our lives to bring him the glory that he deserves. Please, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, please fight for us and protect us. Protect us from this wicked, evil, satanic world, the satanic system, the satanic political judicial system. Holy Spirit, please. Do not let us go. Do not turn your back on us. Turn your face from us. Because if you leave us, Holy Spirit, then it's inevitable we will perish. As even King David said in Psalm 51, verse 11, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Do not leave us, Holy Spirit. Do not leave me, Holy Spirit. We need you. 
Fill me with wisdom and knowledge from your presence to bless your people here, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus. Save me from error, stammering, and confusion, and from unrighteous anger. And just seal us and fill us with fruit from your presence, life from your presence, love and peace and joy and wisdom from your presence, and boldness from your presence, as well as compassion and humility. And Holy Spirit, own my daughters completely. Seal them completely. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Love them as only you can love them. And be with them this Christmas. It's, it's a lonely world, Holy Spirit. It's a lonely world. It's a hard world, Holy Spirit. It is. We will remain if you want us to remain. But to depart, to bark, to be with Christ is far better. Prepare me for my departure to enter the presence of Jesus by your power and your peace just filling me. Your will be done. We need you. In Jesus' name, Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Folks, help me to help you. First and the last is not here yet, nor Protestant believer. So I'm going to have to be reading the passages, which I don't mind. But help me to help you. Keep your comments rele relevant to the topic. No side tangents, no debates with each other. Do not bring up irrelevant issues. And if you're here to attack or mock or blaspheme, I'm going to block you. I'm trusting the Spirit to give me the grace not to even indulge fools, but just to get rid of them, to focus on those who are serious. And hit the like button and ask the Lord to bring more people to this channel if he's pleased to use my meager efforts for his glory. And, oh, by the way, I just want to, again, reach out and say this. Many of you are partnering with me financially to help me to do ministry. You know who you are. <clears throat> I just want to say this. If I don't respond to you, and you guys are going to be listening to this. If I don't respond to you, please don't think that I'm not appreciative of the fact that you're prayerfully <clears throat> supporting the ministry financially. You're making sacrifices financially because you believe that the Lord has called me to do ministry and you want to help me do it for his glory. I truly thank you from my heart. You know who you are. I pray that in the near future, I'll have more time so I can then personally write to every one of you and thank you. But you know who you are, and I thank you, and I thank Jesus for you, and I ask Jesus to bless you because your reward is from Jesus, not from me. He will reward you because you're doing it for his glory, right? And I thank Jesus for putting it in your hearts. May he bless you abundantly and seal you for his glory and use me to bless you for his glory. I just want to thank every one of you. I love you for the sake of Jesus, though I love you imperfectly. <clears throat> and I'm not the best Christian I could be. Thank you for putting up with me and partnering with me. I love you for the sake of Jesus. And again, thank you. God bless you. And one thing, and I'm not knocking people who do this. Please don't misunderstand me. Let me be clear. One of the reasons why I don't do, let's say, Patreon videos or Stuff on Patreon for just those who subscribe via Patreon or helping me via Patreon. It's not because I don't appreciate them. God knows I appreciate you because it is God working through you to fund me to keep on my feet, to be able to do ministry, and to provide for my daily bread, especially for my children. But one of the reasons why I don't do these fringe benefits, because I don't want people who cannot contribute financially. Because I know there are many people who would love to contribute financially to help the work of the men of God and the women of God. But they can't do so. So they pray. And your prayers are even more powerful than your financial giving. But I don't want people who cannot contribute financially want to feel less or insignificant. Because they're not able to contribute financially to these ministries. And those who do, right? are somehow better than them. I don't want to give that impression. And get, guys, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying those who do that for their Patreon subscribers believe that their Patreon subscribers are better than those who don't contribute. That's not what they're doing. They're trying to bless them for contributing. But for me, I really thank you guys for contributing via Patreon. And I will do all I can to serve you. But I hesitate 
even when I first started, I saw people doing it and I thought about doing it. I just hesitate doing because I don't want people to think that somehow because they're incapable of contributing financially, that they are of no use to this ministry. Actually, you are of use to this ministry because your prayers are much more powerful than your finances. Do you know why? Because we serve a Heavenly Father is infinitely rich who can take stones and turn them into bread and can rain manna from heaven. And he can do that and has done it because he's real, right? So even if you cannot provide financially, just praying for me and my daughters and listening to the arguments, studying the materials and using them, you are truly blessing me. Because you know what's more important than simply contributing financially? Learning the material, learning the arguments, learning your faith, learning the Bible, living it out in the power of the Holy Spirit and proclaiming it throughout the world. That's how you bless us in ministry. Yes. Oh, and interestingly here, uh, Gerson Pinto, I'm going to be changing the name of my Patreon account soon, God willing. So look for that because I don't want to lose any supporters. I need more, not less. In time and due course, Lord Jesus willing. But here's what's interesting. I was putting the links to my Patreon in the description box. I went back just yesterday and saw, and they've been removed. They've been removed. I don't know who removed them. Did YouTube do that? In the description box, I was putting links to my articles and to my Patreon. You can also contribute PayPal if you're interested. But someone removed them, and it wasn't me. Right? Hmm, interesting. Now, with that said, let's begin trusting the Spirit to anoint my mouth to speak truth without error and enable me to recall and interpret Scripture correctly and perfectly for the glory of Jesus. We're going to talk about the Magi. And here I hold, by faith I hold, the perfect words of God in English preserved by God so we can have a sure word from him to know him truly, to love him, and live for him. Here it is. This is my King James Bible, authorized King James Version. And by faith, right, I believe this is the perfect word of God. I do believe if you give Patreon, you can then <clears throat> use that. And your taxes, if you give via patron, because they give you a sheet, right? So now with that said, let's talk about the Christmas story specifically of Magi. First, let me destroy some sacred cows. And I pray we get about 200. Come on, 200. I want to see that number get bigger. Come on. Anyway. Let me destroy some sacred cows, some myths about Christmas. You guys ready? And then I'm going to explain to you who the Magi are and their connection with the book of Daniel and the prophet of Daniel and how they knew that the one born king of Israel was worthy of worship. You guys ready? Hopefully I'll be able to do at least two more sessions before Christmas on the Christmas story if the Lord Jesus is pleased. Right? Medic, I would unblock your other name, but I don't know how to unblock. In time, I will block you. But make sure, Medic, I love you, brother. I want you to be the best for Jesus, and I pray we're all the best for Jesus. But medic, put down the game, son. No more games. Focus. Okay. How many of you seen that manger scene in which you have the baby Jesus swaddled in a manger in a stable, and then you have three magi and the shepherds all appearing <clears throat> together at the same time? How many of you have seen that scene? In fact, even in cartoons or movies, right? Yes, Wild Hide, I believe it is. You've seen it, right? Well, let me start destroying some sacred cows. Number one, nowhere in the Bible are we told it was only three wise men. The only reference to the wise men is in Matthew chapter 2. Go take a moment to read it. It doesn't tell us the number of men. It doesn't say three. Pray in Jesus' name, the buffering stops. I don't know why it's buffering. Yep. The reason why people assume it's three men because they gave three gifts. However, we're not told they were three. In fact, the assumption is it was a huge entourage because it would it would have been so huge it got the attention of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the attention of the king, Herod. Right? Do you think three men coming 
into Jerusalem would, ca would have caught the attention of the king. It must have been a huge entourage to cause a stir that it got the king's attention. Number two, the wise men did not appear to Jesus when he was born and did not find him in a manger. If you read Matthew chapter 2, they found Jesus already in his house with his mother, Matthew 2 verse 11, and he was about two years old. The reason why we say he was about two years old is because Herod ordered the slaughter of children two and under, which means that by the time the wise men had reached Jesus, he was already close to two years of age. Right? And if you read Matthew 2, 11, it says they found the child and his mother in the house and they worshiped the child. The child. So that's the second myth we destroy. Yes, the shepherds of the flock did find the babe swaddled, right, in a manger. But they were not accompanied by the wise men. The wise men didn't show up at the same time. They came later when the child was already settled in a house with his parents, his legal father, and his biological mother in Bethlehem. Do you know that? Don't take my word for it. Read Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2, specifically Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. In fact, can I read? You want me to read it? Can I read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12? I can read it. We don't have first and last year, so I'm just going to read it if you guys are interested. Okay, let's read. I won't be able to focus on the comment section while I'm reading. I'm at BibleGateway.com. Here it is, Matthew 2. We're going to start at verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to 12. Are you ready? We ready, guys? Yes, fine. I'm going to get into the word proskinesis and show you that they were worshiping Jesus as deity. This I will answer, God willing, in this session. Were the wise men aware that this child is God in the flesh? Yes, they were. So were they worshiping him as the God man? Yes, they were. I'm going to answer that, Vine, and I'm going to answer it conclusively. You ready? Because Vine asked me a question. When it says that the wise men offered him proskinesis, which comes from proskaneo, the Greek word typically translated as worship. Were the wise men worshiping the child as God in the flesh? If so, how would they know that he's God? Because of the Daniel connection vine. I'm going to show you that the wise men in the Greek, they're called Magoi or Majoi. Magoi, Majoi, Magi. And you're going to see that this very word, guys, pay attention. I need you to pay attention. I need your undivided attention. This very word, because in the Greek of Matthew, here you go. Here you go. Here's the link. Here is BibleHub.com. Don't take my word for it. Click on it, please. Here, go there. You'll see the word is majus or magus, right? And it gives you all the verses in which this word appears in the inspired Greek texts of the New Testament. And you'll notice it's used for the wise men. The King James Version renders it as wise men. But so when, I, when you click on the link, look to your right. And it says, English, Englishman's Concordance, as the Lord loosens my tongue. Englishman's Concordance. Notice it's used in Matthew in reference to the wise men. And it gives you the Greek, Basileos, Matthew 2, 1. Basileos, Idu, Magoi, Apo, an, Anatolon, Anatolon, Anatolon. Someone pronounce it Alatonin. Anatolon meaning from the east. Forgive me for butchering the Erasmian pronunciation of the Greek. Do you see it? And so New American Standard says, the king magi from the east. King James Version, there came wise men from the east, right? King behold, magi from the east. So notice that the word in Greek is magoi or majoi. Everyone confirm that. Let me click on it again. Hafsa, you, uh, I'm sorry. Naomi, you may have to copy and paste the link if it's not opening for you. Everyone see it? Do you see they're called Magoi? Majoi? Everyone see it? 
I'm going to make the connection to Daniel in a minute. But let me just whet your appetite for what's to come. That's the very word that the Greek version of Daniel, folks, pay attention. This is the very word that the Greek version of Daniel uses to describe the astrologers at the time of Daniel. If you read Daniel chapter 1 and 2 and chapter 4 and 5, in the king's palace, you had sorcerers, astrologers, and a group called Chaldeans. And the word, the Greek word for astrologers is majoi. The Greek translation of Daniel identifies those astrologers who were active at the time of Daniel, whom Daniel became chief over. Daniel became their chief. He was the chief of the sorcerers, the astrologers, and the Chaldeans. Daniel was the chief of the astrologers, and the word astrologers was translated in Greek as majoi. Daniel was the chief of the magi. Are you making the connection? Are you making the connection? I'm trying to let it sink in. So now, Matthew 2 is telling you, these magi, because he's using the word magi, which would have been familiar to the Jews who were reading the Old Testament in Greek. Any reader of the Greek version of the Old Testament would have made the connection with the magi of Daniel's time. So this group is the spiritual descendants, the sp spiritual heir. They're from the same class of astrologers that were functioning at the time of Daniel, which means that Daniel instructed the Magi about the coming king of Israel, showing them that this king would be God in the flesh, and they would have preserved that tradition and passed it on until that child arose. That's how they knew that this king of Israel was worthy of their worship. Do you know that? I'm going to prove it to you. Don't take my word for it. I'm going to prove it. I got... The links to the English translation of the Greek. Here, here, let me just hear. Here you go. Is this Daniel 5? Yes, okay, here you go. Here is the English translation, English translation of the Greek of Daniel. Daniel 5. Daniel 5. Here you go. Yeah, ah, Jonathan Simon got it. If these magi are astrologers, that means they busy themselves studying the stars. And Daniel was their chief, and they realized this Daniel is exceptional because God's spirit is in him, revealing mysteries that they themselves don't have access to, could not comprehend. So they came under his tutelage, and he would have instructed them about the Messiah, who's God in the flesh. And how do we know he would have instructed them? Because it's Daniel who tells us about the Son of Man who rides the clouds of heaven, who approaches the Ancient of Days, whom all nations, including the Magi and their nation, must worship. <whistles> Do you see now why the Magi worshipped the King of Israel? There's the link. Yes, he is the best hater in the world, Mike Smith. Can you guys see the link? Now here's what I want you to see if you're going to the Greek there. Go to Daniel 5. Let's see which particular verse. Okay. Yeah, go to Daniel 5.11. Daniel 5.11. Here is the English translation of the Greek. Daniel 5.11. There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of God. And in the days of thy father, talking about Belshazzar now, talking about his ancestor Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, watchful understanding, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, made him chief of the enchanters, magicians, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel the chief of the magicians. Now, when you go and look at the Greek, let me get you the Greek, okay? Here it is. He was the chief of the majun. Chief of the majun. Here you go. You got it now? Now everything makes sense, and you again see the beautiful supernatural consistency of the scriptures. Matthew simply mentions Majoi, 
coming from the east, which means from Persia, even Babylon. Because remember, when Persia conquered Babylon, they made their capital in Babylon, right? So now you're making the connection. How could these wise men who are Gentiles, how can these wise men who are Gentiles know so much about the king of Israel? Because of Daniel, who was the chief of their spiritual forebears, who instructed them about the coming king, being God in the flesh, whom all nations must submit to and worship, they would have taken that information and passed it on to each successive generation of classes of Majoi. Clear? Everyone make, is it making sense, everyone, before I move on? Before I move on? So now it makes more sense why the wise men would know enough to worship the king and to answer vine. They're not simply honoring him as a king. They're worshiping him as the God-man, the divine king, whom all nations must submit to. And where would they know this from? Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Okay, now, before I go and pack it further, everyone getting this? I, there's no need to distinguish between astrology, astrologers back then and, and today, right? Because no one is saying that astrology is an acceptable practice. We're saying that pagans who engaged astrology came to the saving knowledge of God and then would have sought to then, quote unquote, Christianize their study of the stars so that it wouldn't violate the worship of the true God. But that doesn't mean we engage in it. Right? Clear? And Vine, are you getting some of the points showing that they would have been worshiping the child and not simply honoring the child? Now, let me give you another line of evidence supporting that they were worshiping the child, not simply honoring the child. Okay, Matthew 2.11. Oops, I got to break it down in two. Matthew 2.11, here it is. I'm going to read the entire chapter in a moment, but pay attention with me. And when they came into the house, notice, did they come into a manger and see a babe swaddled? Right? In a manger? Or did they enter a house? Pay attention. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child, not the babe, he's a child, with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Right? You guys seeing this? Even if there is no difference, Jonathan, Simon, it's irrelevant to the point that you have pagans indulging in pagan practices or coming to a saving knowledge of God and then would Christianize those practices to comport to the teachings of God without this meaning that we can engage in those practices and do likewise. Let's not get into tangents. I don't need too many chiefs, few Indians. And Master Assassin is going to be sent on his merry way because guess what? We're talking about the Magi and he's talking about the Quran. Bye-bye, Master Assassin. I hope you enjoy your free ride. Hold on. Oh, my God. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, let's read it again. When they came into the house... Notice they don't find him in a stable, and they don't find a babe swaddled in a manger. They came to a house in Bethlehem. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. Now, what leads me to believe that they're worshipping him as the God-man and not simply honoring him. Number one, the connection with Daniel, which I'll make more explicit in a minute. 
We're going to go into Daniel in a minute, showing you where the Greek version identifies those astrologers as the Magi. And being under Daniel's authority and tutelage, Daniel would have preached to them about who the true God is and the coming king. Okay, But the second line of evidence is found in Matthew 2.11 for the discerning reader. Notice it did not say they worshipped him and the mother. There you would then argue that it cannot be worship given to a deity, but he's an honor given to a king and the king's mother, right? It said they worshipped him, not him and his mother. The fact that the text clearly says him is another point that strongly argues that they're not simply giving him honor, but worshipping him as God, something they could not give to his mother because his mother is not divine. You want me there? Everyone got it? See what Matthew 2.11 says? They found the child in the house with Mary, his mother, and worshipped him. If it's merely honor, then we would expect they would honor him and his mother for virtue of the fact that she's his mother. Right? But it says worshipped him. The fact it says him and doesn't say Mary argue strongly that they were not simply honoring him because if they were simply honoring him, they could extend that honor to the mother of the king because of her status as his mother. But the fact that it says worshiping him shows that it's worship given to someone whom they view as deity, as divine. Right? Everyone with me there? Everyone understand the connection with Daniel, that Daniel would have told him about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven who will be worshipped by all nations. And the Aramaic Pilach in the book of Daniel is used for that service, worship given to God alone. Daniel 7, 13, 14. And the fact that they worship the Son, but not the Son and His mother. There, if it said they worship the Son and mother, then that would clearly mean it wasn't worship to a divine being that they were rendering. Simply honor for status as king and honoring his mother as the mother of the king. So far, are you getting what I'm saying? I hope I'm not putting you to sleep with this. I know I can be very boring, but I hope you're seeing the clarity and why the Magi would have known so much about the child. They're not Israelites. They are Gentiles. Astrologers from the east, right? From Babylon, if not Persia. But how did they know so much about the child? Because of the Daniel connection. They knew so much about the child because of Daniel. So this is why Matthew, when he mentions the fact that they're called Majoi, he assumes that his readers who are familiar with the Greek translation of the Old Testament would make the connection with the Majoi of Daniel. Right? Another line of evidence that would suggest that they're worshiping him as God, as the God-man, as God becoming a human babe in order to rule the nations is the gifts that they give to him. There's a lot of meat in the Christmas story. But there are a lot of myths in the Christmas story, like three wise men and visiting the babe in the manger as opposed to visiting a child who's about two years old in a house in Bethlehem at a different time from when the shepherds came to see him. Okay. There's another line that suggests that they're worshiping him. The gifts that they gave to him. Let's look at Matthew 2, 11 again. Right? And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, Gold is what you give as tribute to a king, right? Read throughout the Old Testament as well as ancient Near Eastern cultures. When a, a king visits a reigning king, a king that has subjugated him, or a king that he's trying to appease and enter into covenant relations with so he doesn't get attacked by that king, he'll either appear or send representatives with gifts, one of which includes 
lavishing gold, gold as tribute to the king. So giving him gold, indication of what? His royalty. But notice what they give him, frankincense. Why? Frankincense is what priests use in their priestly service as an act of worship to God. No, 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 no. It's not anointing a king. Frankincense is what you use in priestly service, in sacred service, in service to deity. With me there? Are you understanding? Now the myrrh, he says he doesn't know why. Now this tells us that they knew a lot more than a surface level reading of the text would imply. They would have known because of Daniel's prophecies and because Daniel instructing them that this king would also die to propitiate for our sins because myrrh is what you do to anoint and prepare dead bodies for burial. Do you see how much they knew about the child? He's king, he's God, and will die. But why will he die? Well, Daniel, Daniel 9 tells us why. The anointed one will be cut off. And Daniel would have instructed them on the other prophecies related to King Messiah dying to propitiate for our sins, to appease God's wrath for our sins. So that means they would have known all of this because of what Daniel would have taught their spiritual forebears. Because frankincense is what is offered in the temple. Just do a search, Shamir. Shamir, don't, don't let me do the search for you. It's like asking me, how do I know gold is given for kings? Because I just made it up on the spot. Yes, Jonathan. Myrrh is the balm, balm applied to a body to prepare it for burial. Exactly, Jonathan Simon. So those three gifts tell us that they knew he is royalty, he's king. He is divine. He's God and will die. But why will he die? Because Daniel 9, as well as the prophecies that Daniel had studied and would have then shared with the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, indicate that the King Messiah, the Messianic King, is not only divine, but would come and offer his life as an asham, a guilt offering, Isaiah 53.10, to propitiate for our sins and remove God's wrath. Zero one, you're giving me a tradition that comes centuries after the fact. Zero one, where in the Bible does it say their names are Casper, Balthazar, and Melchior? Besides the fact that you're watching too many Jesus of Nazareth films. The only place in the Bible where the wise men are mentioned, Matthew chapter 2. So 0-1, I'll give you $10 million and Riaz will take Shahada if you can show me that there are three and their names are Casper, Balthazar, and Melchior. You're watching too many Netflix films on Christmas. And outside of the Bible, how many centuries after the biblical story do we find this tradition that there are three men and these are their names? I don't know what you mean. The church at Antioch taking off like wildfire. Let me repeat. Three men would not have gotten the attention of King Herod. Do you think three men entering into Jerusalem would have gotten the attention and made an uproar so that King Herod asks to have an audience with them? Or do you think it would have been a huge entourage of people that when they came to Jerusalem would have gotten the attention of the common folk and word would have reached Herod, hey, we got some royalty coming in. A huge entourage of people from the east. They're here for some reason. Right? The reason why a tradition rose that there are three men is because of three gifts. They're assuming there must have been three men who gave three different gifts. Why? 
Why? So far, are you with me or am I losing you? And you're seeing how amazing the Christmas story happens to be. Well, Psalm 23, if you keep praying for my health to get healthier, you keep praying for my holiness and purity to truly be in love with Jesus and be pure for Jesus, pray for a miraculous protection of my daughters and I and the provision to do ministry, I'll keep teaching as long as the Holy Spirit wants me to. Yes, exactly, Andrew. You think three men are going to travel from the east by themselves for such a momentous event? Or do you think a group of Majoy, a group of astrologers would have rushed to see the fulfillment of the prophecy that Daniel uttered to their spiritual forebears? Right? Yes, I know that John MacArthur did an in-depth study on the background of the Magi, and they're the ones who prepared kings, right? I understand where you're going with this specalog. That's where you got your information from, because you must have listened to John MacArthur's sermon when he went. He did an entire session on the background of the Magi. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible and trying to use sources that we can access, right? So the sources I'm giving you, Specalog, you can access. They're online for free. So that if someone asks you, prove it. Here you go, right? And don't get me wrong. John MacArthur is a beast. He's a theological beast, a genius who, who's an amazing man of God who knows the word. I can't hold a candlestick next to him. So don't take that as criticism of it. What I'm saying is I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible and use sources that are accessible to anyone and everyone. So they don't need to go to a library or a seminary and access a uh, you know, seminary library to get this information. All you need is internet, biblehub.com, the translation of the Greek Old Testament in English. All of this is online, a fingertip away, right? Clear? Well, let me read Matthew 2 in context. Are you ready now? Yep. Are you ready for me to read Matthew 2 and then Luke 2 to so the show? Number one, they weren't three men. Number two, they didn't appear in the manger, in a stable, when Jesus was a babe, along with the shepherds of the flock. Those two things did not happen at the same time. What you're going to discover is they were magi from the east. We're not told how many, but it must have been a huge entourage to get the attention of King Herod and to trouble him. He was even troubled. You came all this way for some king that I'm not aware of, that I haven't heard about, a king who can pose a challenge to my throne because Herod considered himself the king of the Jews. He was an Edomian, meaning he was an Edomite. Many people don't know that Herod was an Edomian, an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, and a madman who even killed his wife and son because he was paranoid about someone usurping his throne. Right? So what you're going to learn as we read wasn't three. It must have been a huge entourage. It's number one. And they appeared at a different time than the shepherds of the flock, the shepherds of the flock did come when Mary had just conceived her son by the power of the Holy Spirit as a virgin and did find the baby Jesus swaddled in a manger. And the wise men came when Jesus was about two years old. Why do I say when he was about two years old? Let's read. Are we ready? Oh, first last is here. First last. Are you free to post verses or should I just read it out loud? Let me tell you why I keep saying Jesus was around two years old. Let's make it real quick. Okay, before you post, here. Okay. Let me just do this real quick. Watch here. Matthew 2.16. Read with me. Matthew 2.16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, was utterly furious and sent forth and killed all the male children who were born in Bethlehem and the surrounding region from two years old and under based on the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Did you catch it? He calculated the approximate age of the child due to the time, right? 
And he concluded that the child would be somewhere near two years old. So he ordered the murder, the slaughter of children two and under. Why, if Jesus was still a babe? If Jesus was just a babe, why not just order the slaughter of all newborn babes, infants? Did everyone get it? Matthew 2.16? So due to this passage, due to this passage, love dove, do me a favor. Don't parrot outdated arguments that have been thoroughly decimated. There is historical proof that December 25th was being observed by Christians long before the pagans, and the pagans took it from Christians. Don't be a parrot and parrot outdated myths. Keep up to date. You want me there? You understand? Because of the order of slaughtering children two and under, that tells us that Jesus would have been closer to two years of age, which explains Matthew 2.11, explains Matthew 2.11, that says they found the child, not the babe, even though the term child can refer to a babe, right? They found the child in a house, not in a stable or in a manger. I think Love Dove needs to be sent on his or her merry way. Okay. Everyone got it? Let's hear Let's read Matthew 2 11 again. And when they were coming to the house, folks, did they come to a stable, a manger, to an inn, or were they already settled in a house? Exactly, Russo. Julian the apostate. In order to persecute Christianity, he's the one who took December 25th and tried to tie it in with uh, <clears throat> the sun god. But that's because he was taking it from the Christians and paganizing it. Okay, House, not a stable, not a manger, not an inn. Right? I'm going to get to the star in a minute. Because I'm going to give you what I believe the star was and what the star wasn't. Vine, I'm going to show you that the star wasn't a shining object, an astral object. I believe it was actually an angelic being that they took to be a star that guided them to the house, disappeared, and reappeared. And I'll show you that the Bible does call angels stars. So I don't take it as a shiny object in the sky. I know there are Christians who believe it was an actual star in the sky, and they try to calculate whether something unusual happened in the sky at that time and connect it with the time of Jesus' birth. I believe, on the contrary, that it's not an actual shiny object star, but it was an angelic being appearing <clears throat> luminously, that they took to be a star and that guided their course because it says that they found the star and it guided them to Herod and then reappeared again and then guided them to the house. Man, that's some unusual star, right? So everyone with me? I don't take it as an actual shining object. I take it as a spirit being, a spirit creature manifesting luminously, right? That they took to be a shining object that was guiding their path. And they knew this shining object signified the birth of the king of Israel. And I'll explain the connection with the star and the king of Israel in a minute. But I want to go slowly. And I'm trusting the spirit to help me to speak truth without error and not to confuse you. But I need to make sure you guys are in the saddle. And so far, you're with me, and you're getting it. There are Christians who do believe it is a star. They may be right. And that's why they try to look into ancient astrological charts and find if there was anything unusual out of the ordinary that took place in the skies and connect that with the birth of Christ. I know of one documentary that did that, and they say it was amazing. I never watched it. So... Possibly, but I believe because of the movement of the star, it wasn't an actual shining object, but a spirit being. Right? 
Yeah, that's the documentary I'm talking about, Bethlehem Star. Now, if you watch that, you're convinced that's fine. I'm not against it being a shining object. But the movement of the star in Matthew 2, quite unusual if it's a shining object, but it makes a whole lot of sense if it's a spirit being that appears luminously as a shining object that's guiding them. Thank you, jumping like a monkey. You see my point? The way Matthew describes a star is quite unusual. And note, they say they saw a star. Because remember, they're astrologers. So how's God going to communicate to them in their language and show them some unusual, amazing phenomenon? And why a star? Because it connects with an ancient prophecy in Numbers 24. Thank you, DFID. Planets shine, move, disappear, reappear, go backwards from our vantage point. Yes, but this particular star takes them right to King Herod's palace and then disappears and then shows up and then takes them right to the house. Yeah, pretty amazing for a shining object. And now it can be done. Don't get me wrong. God is almighty. Because God is almighty, he can do that. But DFID, you're still not following me. Let me try this again. Maybe I wasn't clear the first three times. If you read Matthew 2, the star takes them to Herod and then disappears and then reappears and then takes them to the house. You're still not getting it, though. Even if it's a star in the sky, that's unusual. That means God must have done something miraculously to make a shining object to give the impression that it's moving towards a specific location Disappear and then reappears and moves towards another location. So it still has to be a miracle. Or it could be the miracle of an angel looking like a star in order to communicate in their language because they were astrologers. I don't know how much clearer I can make it. I don't know if you're humble. I don't know if you're being humble and thinking you're my humble student. right? Thank you, first and last. Say that again. First lance, and stars don't travel at the speed of camels. And let's look at Matthew 2, verses 111. Let's unpack it. Are you guys ready? So we start unpacking it slowly? Okay, let's read. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king of king, behold, there came wise men. The Greek word is magi. There came magi from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. We have seen his star in the east. So his star showed up in the east. Okay, follow now the course. And are come to worship him, trusting the spirit to correct me when I'm mistaken. In Jesus' name. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why are they troubled with three men? No, it would be a huge entourage that got their attention and they knew something Earth shattering is about to take place. Something miraculous is happening here. All right. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Hey, okay. They're talking about the king of Israel. We know the Jews are waiting for the Messianic king. Where in the Old Testament are we told where this king of Israel, the anointed one, the Messiah from David, would be born? Now notice what they quote. I'm going to come back to, math, uh, to that prophecy in a minute. <clears throat> now let's pick it up at four and four, four to wait, wait four yeah let me read four again and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together he demanded of them where christ should be born now notice five and six where they said and they said unto him in bethlehem of judea for thus it is written by the prophet and thou bethlehem in the land of judah art not the least among the princes of judah for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people israel Quoting Micah chapter 5 verse 2 with, with a dash of 2 Samuel 5 2 combined in that prophecy. I'll get to that later. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, the magi, the magi, called them privately, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when, they, when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. 
Wow, hold on, guys. So you mean the stars decided just to park outside until their conversation finished? And when the conversation finished, then the stars decided to start moving? Interesting, isn't it? Did you catch what you just read? So the star decided to take to, to take it easy, chill, and just park until they came out. And lo, lo and behold, when they come out, it starts moving. Okay, fellas, let's start moving. <laughs> Let me read nine again. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And they decides to park over the house again. Man, this star is pretty amazing. He just so happens to know this is the house, and I'm going to park it right here for the night. When they, they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. You caught it now? Everyone with me there? Before I move on, did it sink in what you just read? Star shows up in the east and guides them to Herod's place. All of a sudden, they come out and he starts move, or it starts moving again. Appears, right? Brings them to Herod's place. It's gone for them for that moment. They come out, they see it again. Oh, and it starts moving. Oh, there it goes. And decides to park right where the child's home happens to be. Does it make more sense that this is a shining object in the sky or an angelic creature, an angelic being? Juan, I was going to bring that up in a moment. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's in space or a sky above. It depends on your interpretation. If you're saying it's a shiny object, then it has to be in space because the stars are not in the atmosphere. But if you're saying it's an angelic creature, then yes, it would be in our atmosphere. So it depends on your interpretation. That's why I say it doesn't really matter because if you take that it's a shining object, then the only answer is that it's a star in space that they're seeing. Millions of miles away, which God can do. I'm not saying God can do it. He's almighty. Just like he slowed down the earth's rotation so that from Joshua's perspective, it seemed like the sun did not set. Even though, well, anyway, there are flat earthers that are going to argue with me. Anyway, who cares? I, I forget that there's a growing movement of flat earthers. Pray for the connection. Pray for the buffering. It keeps buffering, right? Yeah, I, I forget there are flat earthers that use Joshua 10 as proof that the earth is flat and that it's a geocentric creation and that the sun revolves around the earth, not the other way around. So I forgot that's not a good argument. All right. But anyway, let's come back to the issue because I don't want to get into the debate. Does the Bible teach a flat earth and the science confirm it's a flat earth and this is a government conspiracy to attack the Bible? I don't, I don't care about that debate, man. Let's, let's just focus on this. Even if you believe it's a flat earth and the sun was prevented from setting, that still requires the infinite power of God to perform that miracle. So that God who could do that for the sun can do it for a star in space. But if you take it as an angelic creature, then that star would have been in the atmosphere, not in space. You get my point? Is that clear? Let's read now Matthew 2, 12 and 13. Matthew 2, 12 and 13. Matthew 2, 12 to 13. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they depart into their own country another way. So why? Wow, 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 wow. <whistles> These magi also receiving revelation from God. See, how many of you, how many of you missed that? That these magi knew a lot more than you thought they did, and they were steeped in the scriptures of the Jews and the prophecies of the one to come to such an extent that now God is even speaking to them in a dream and telling them, do not return to Herod, but go another way. And when 
They were departed. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Wow. So like Joseph, the Magi are also receiving revelations in dream. Did you make the connection? God spoke to them in a dream. The angel of God spoke to Joseph in a dream. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So wait, folks. The Magi and Joseph receiving revelations from God in dreams. Hmm. The Magi knew the king of Israel is worthy of worship. And they knew this was the star heralding his birth. Or so they thought. So should we assume the star is a shiny object in space? Or is it most likely an angelic creature appearing luminously as a shining object in order to communicate to them in their language because they were astrologers? No, it's not. A possibility, Air Church. That's the point I'm making. These are the Magi who would have been the students of the students of the students of the students of the Magi that Daniel was chief over. Now, if you still believe it's a shiny object in, in space, that's fine. Uh, there are many Christians who believe that. I don't know if you're here first, last. I already made... Uh, DFID, we don't really care what you go for personally. Can you keep your personal opinions to yourself? Because now you're trying to egg me on into a debate, you see? And you're tempting me to show you why you can't defend your position. Can we see DFID somewhere else? He can be uh, fiddling somewhere else. Yeah, first last, I just showed from the Greek version of Daniel that the astrologers, the astrologers are called Majoi in the Greek. Did you know that? Here. Let me prove it to you. And I'm going to unpack it a little more. First and last, go here. And I want you to look at Daniel 5.11. Daniel 5.11, Belshazzar is told that Daniel is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of God. And in the days of thy father, watchful and understanding were found in him. And a king, and King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, made him chief of the enchanters, magicians. Daniel was made the chief of magicians. Look at the Greek. It's majun, majun or magun. You got it there? You see that first and last? The astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, all under the authority of Daniel because of the great wisdom and revelation God had given him and because God's spirit was in, in him speaking through him. And the word astrologers in the Aramaic was translated by the Jews in Greek as magun or majun. Do you see it? So do you see now the connection between Matthew 2 and Daniel? So Matthew is writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is assuming the Greek readers, especially if they're Jews, who have read the Greek Old Testament, would then identify the Magi with the same class of astrologers that were there at the time of Daniel, which tells us that's why they knew enough to worship the child because Daniel, who would have taught them the, about the true God, taught them about the scriptures, told them about the coming king like he did in Daniel 7, Daniel 7, they would have been aware that the one to come to rule over Israel is the God-man whom all nations must submit to and worship. Magus in English would be with an S, not an N. Magus, you're giving me the Greek <clears throat> Greek wording, and there at the end is an S, not a nu. Exactly, Jade Rabbit. Magun, yes, the nu. Right? You see how these astrologers and the Chaldeans and the sorcerers were all taught by Daniel. The true God, the true religion, and the coming one, whom they knew would be God in the flesh and that they needed to submit to. Is, is it sinking in? And I just gave you the references from Daniel, right?
And it's not just Daniel 5.11. It's also Daniel 5.15. Daniel 5.15 and Daniel 5.7. Daniel chapter 5 verse 7, verse 11 and verse 15. The Greek translation of those verses call the astrologers magicians or magoi. Magoi. Magos. Magun. Right? These are different cases of the same word. And Daniel 4.4. 4. Daniel 4.4. 4. They're again a reference to astrologers and they're called Magoi in the Greek translation of Daniel. Okay, Daniel 440. See it? He just posted it. Okay, and then you see over there it says Magoi. This is the same word that Matthew uses in Matthew chapter 2. Don't believe me? Here you go. Don't believe me? Here you go. Here's the link for the word that Matthew uses. Click on it. You'll see it says Strong's Greek number 3097, Magos. And then to your right, in Englishman's Concordance, it shows you where this word is used throughout the New Testament. And you see it's used in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, verse 7, verse 16. And if you look at Matthew 2, 1 in the Greek, it says Basileus, Idu, Magoi, Magoi. Same word. See, in Spanish is magos. You guys see it? So now the Greek reader of Matthew would have made the connection with Daniel. Oh, these are the magi of Daniel. That's how they knew so much about our king. That's how they knew so much about our king. Is this all making sense? Is it all sinking in? So if someone asks you, were the Magi worshiping Jesus as God or giving him honor as king? They were worshiping him as God. Why do I say worshiping him as God? Because they would have known from what Daniel had taught their spiritual forebears, what Daniel had taught their spiritual forebears, that the king of Israel is the son of man who appears as a man, but he's actually God in human flesh. Whom all nations must submit to and worship. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And so they came to worship the God-man, the king of Israel. Not simply honor him as king. Is it making sense? So if someone says to you, you shouldn't translate the Greek word there, proskuneo, as worship. How would they have known to worship him? They would have known because they're the Magi. They belong to the same class that was functioning at the time of Daniel. Daniel was the chief of the Magi in the 6th century. And he would have taught the Magi about the true God, the true faith, the true religion, and the coming king being the God-man, distinct from God, yet one with him in essence, who appears in human form, whom all nations must submit to and worship. Right? And on top of that, Matthew 2, 12, Matthew 2, 12, it says God spoke to them in a dream. Why is God appearing to pagan idolaters in dreams, instructing them? Because they weren't pagan idolaters. They were God worshipers. They had been converted by Daniel and were waiting for the fulfillment of the promise that God made through Daniel. Yes, Terp. Well, Anna, they'll tell you they're bowing to him because they're showing him honor for being the king. But it's more than honor. It's worship because they realize he's the God man. Is it making sense? I don't, I don't know if it is. Are you getting it? No, Roscoe, not so much frankincense for a priest. Frankincense for God. They're offering frankincense because they're functioning as priests, giving him tribute and giving him a sacrifice and acknowledgement of his deity. Roscoe. Not for a priest. They're the priest offering frankincense to their God. They're the subjects offering gold as tribute to their king. 
uh, jumping like a monkey. What more evidence do you need from the fact that Matthew calls them magi? Can you explain to me why Matthew is calling them magi, knowing that the Greek version of Daniel uses that very term for that class of astrologers? Of all the terms that he could have used, jumping like a monkey, why did he use that very word that connects them with that group that was functioning at the time of Daniel? No, but I'm, that's why I'm asking you. So you see that solid, and anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear can't refute it. But if someone is hardened, no, no amount of evidence will, be, will convince them otherwise. Right, jumping? So what you ask the person, is it a coincidence that Matthew uses the Greek word ma, ma, magoi or majoi, that for his audience, who would have been steeped in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, would have automatically connected with the Magi of Daniel. Yeah, that's Daniel 9, Attila. Daniel 9, 25 to 27. Exactly, fish. Burn bones, you got it. So you want me to unpack the implication of the gifts again? You guys got it because I mentioned it. Some of you already knew it because you studied it. But let me again repeat the significance of the gifts one more time, okay? Because I don't want to. I see you see why I take my time and I go very slow and I repeat myself over and over again. I know some people complain, but I hope you appreciate it because when I repeat something and go slow, then it sinks in much better by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that you can now absorb it and use it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. Right? Right? So let me again show you from the gifts that they give, from the gifts that they give, it shows us they are aware the child is God, the child is king, and the child will die. Let's look at Matthew 2.11 again. And please, you can just easily go online to any of these Bible search engines Go online to any of these Bible search engines and see what I'm about to tell you is confirmed in the Old Testament. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child. Note first and last, you weren't here when I broke this down. Notice he's not in a stable or in an inn or in a manger. He's in a house. So they don't come when Jesus is a babe in swaddling clothes in a manger or a stable. He's already in a house. They're already situated in a house. Right, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Notice the second thing, first and last. If the word proskeneo here, proskenesis from proskeneo, simply meant they were honoring him as royalty, then we would expect they would give such honor to his blessed mother. They would honor the king and the king's mother. But notice, first and last, that they gave proskeneo only to the child because it indicates that they weren't simply honoring him, but worshiping him as God. And that's why they didn't extend that to Mary, his mother. Right? Now notice the gifts. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold. Read the Old Testament. Read Solomon. When the Queen of Sheba came, or 1 Kings 10. What did they give Solomon? As tribute, gold and silver. So gold is a tribute to a king. Frankincense. Frankincense is what priests burn in the temple. It's part of their priestly service. And myrrh. Myrrh is what they use to prepare dead bodies for burial. Embalming the bodies in myrrh. So notice the three gifts signify he is royalty, he's king. He is God, worthy of sacred service, of priestly worship. And he shall die. They knew all that about him. Now, someone will say, well, how would they know that he was going to die? The Daniel factor again. Because in Daniel 9, 25 to 27, he already tells us that the anointed one will be cut off, will be killed. And after he's cut off and killed, the city and the temple will be destroyed. And on top of that, Daniel was steeped in the Hebrew scriptures 
studied the Hebrew scriptures and would have known the prophecies that the Son of Man, who's the Messiah, would die to propitiate for our sins and would have passed that revelation on to the Magi. <whistles> Can I prove to you that Daniel had copies of the Old Testament books that were written up until his time by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and was studying them to know God's word to the prophets that came before him so he could build on their foundation? Can I prove that to you guys? Can I prove that to you guys? That he was steeped in the Old Testament. He read all the books of the prophets that came up to that time and was saturating himself with their words to understand their words and built upon them. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3, pay attention to verse 2. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3, pay attention to verse 2. Let's read. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3, pay attention to verse 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, Xerxes, man, Artaxerxes, every pronounce that name, Woo, these names, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Wait, 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 wait. Daniel, you understood by books? You're reading books? One of which was the book of Jeremiah. The word of Jehovah came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face up unto the Lord God, Jehovah God, to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Wait, 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 guys. Did you read too? He had books set before him. Books that he was reading. And one of those books was the book written by Jeremiah when the word of God came to Jeremiah announcing the captivity of the Jews for 70 years. So you mean Daniel was having Bible study in the palace? Copies of the Old Testament that he was pouring over, reading to understand God's will. Post Daniel 9 2 again, first and last, one more time. I don't, I don't think it sunk in. One more time. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. Notice books, plural. He had books. The number of the years. So these books told him how many years the Jews would be in captivity. And one of those books is the word of Jehovah came to Jeremiah the prophet. Wait, wait, wait. Daniel, you got books of the prophets that wrote before you and during your time? Yeah. And one of those books you have is Jeremiah's book? Yes. But folks, here's where I'm confused. Jeremiah was a contemporary with Daniel. Jeremiah was prophesying in Jerusalem at the same time that Daniel was prophesying in Babylon in the king's palace. And in Babylon, Daniel has heard of Jeremiah the prophet, heard of his writing, and has asked for a copy of his prophecy to be sent to him so he can study. Fire. I don't think you got it. Did you guys get it? Before I move on? Jeremiah is prophesying around the same time that Daniel was. Okay? Daniel is in Babylon in the palace of the king. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, hundreds of miles away. But he's already heard that Jeremiah is a prophet who's written down scripture, and he's asked for a copy of his prophecy. And he's reading it. Oh. No need to repeat. You should get it. Daniel just told you he had books that told him the number of years that the Jews would remain in captivity and be set freed. And he understood from the word of Jehovah that came to Jeremiah. But wait, Daniel. Jeremiah was your contemporary. You and him were both prophesying around the same time, though Daniel's ministry lasted a little longer. So you already know about Jeremiah in Jerusalem, and you're in Iraq, in Babylon? Yeah. And you already have a copy of his, of his writing, his prophetic writing? Yes. You got a copy? Something he wrote in Jerusalem already reached you in Babylon? Yes. Why are you reading it? 
Because it's the word of my God. That's why. So if a prophet receiving revelation from God is busying himself studying prophetic writings inspired by the Spirit, how much more should we be studying the Bible when we're not prophets receiving revelation like they did? Sink in. A prophet of God, highly exalted Daniel, he's highly exalted, Daniel, highly exalted, receiving revelation from God, miraculously, that's blowing the minds of the king and his court, his palace, leaving them no doubt this man is a servant of the true God and God's spirit is truly in him, making mysteries known to him that no one knows but is God. And this prophet is still reading prophetic books written by people who came before him, and one in particular written by a contemporary of his who is in Jerusalem, and he's asked to get a copy of that writing. Bring it to me. I want to read what God told him so I can learn from him. How much more should we be studying these books? What else is Daniel reading? Daniel 9, 11, and 13. Daniel 9, verse 11 and 13. May the Lord Jesus save me from error and misinterpretation and empower us to live his word perfectly, to love him perfectly, to be washed in the blood of Jesus and our children as well, my daughters, in Jesus' name. And read Daniel 9, 11 and 13. Read with me. God, Daniel's praying to God and reminding God of what's written in the prophetic writings. He's praying to God. Notice what he says. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured out upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against, against him. Wait, wait, Daniel. How do you know the curses written in the law of Moses if you don't have a copy of the law of Moses and you're not reading it? Now, let's read 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before Yehovah, Jehovah our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Wait, Daniel, how do you know about the judgments and curses that God warned in the law of Moses, which Moses wrote down, if you don't have a copy of Moses and you're not reading it? Are you getting it? Or no, is it sinking in? Before I move on, is it, before I move on, is it sinking in? Daniel has copies of all the prophetic writings, starting with Moses, in his possession in the sixth century in the 500s. He even has a copy of the prophetic writing of Jeremiah, which Berechiah. Jeremiah's scribe wrote for Jeremiah. And yet Jeremiah and Daniel were contemporaries. They were both spirit-filled and prophesying during the same time. Jeremiah in Jerusalem and Daniel in the king's palace in Babylon. Oh, see, I'm repeating because I want you to see the supernatural consistency, divine origin of these writings, and how these prophets confirm one another. And how these prophets are learning from one another. And how these prophets are dependent on the revelation given to the others. Because they realize God hasn't given me all the revelation. He's given me bits of it. And he's given bits of that revelation to someone else. And I need all of it to understand the total picture. Right? Yep, fish bones. That's what you read. Now let me shock you a little further. Ones means yes. One means yes. Two means no. When I say, do you get it? One means yes, Attila. Two means no. Okay. Now let me show you more evidence of the supernatural consistency of the Bible and how different prophets confirm the writings of other prophets before them or that were contemporary with them. Showing that the prophets knew God didn't give them all the details. 
but gave bits and pieces to one prophet and bits and pieces to another prophet. And they had to read all of these <clears throat> prophetic writings to get the complete picture, to get all the pieces to the puzzle. Okay, are we ready now for the other one? We have three contemporaries who are receiving revelation from God and writing down prophetic writings, books of prophecy by inspiration at the same time. Three. I'm not saying there weren't more prophets. What I'm saying, we have at least three prophets whose writings have come down to us, preserved by the Spirit, that were contemporary with one another and writing around the same time and acknowledging one another. Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Daniel just confirmed Jeremiah. Ezekiel confirms Daniel. Now here's what's shocking. Ezekiel is receiving revelation from the Spirit at the same time Jeremiah in Jerusalem is receiving revelation. And at the same time that Daniel is receiving revelation in the court's palace and Ezekiel is receiving it while he's in Babylon in Iraq. But he's with the common folk and Daniel's in the palace. You, you with me there? Ezekiel and Daniel are both in Babylon, Iraq. Ezekiel is with the common folk living in Iraq and Babylon, whereas Daniel is in the palace of the king. But they're both in Babylon, both in Iraq. Okay? And Ezekiel is aware that Daniel is a prophet highly honored by God. How do I know? Ezekiel 14, 14. Ezekiel 14, verse 14. Here you go. So you don't, don't take my word for it. Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord Jehovah. Wait, wait, wait. Which three men? Job we know. Noah we know. Daniel? So God is telling Ezekiel that even if Daniel and Job and Noah were in Jerusalem, they would not be able to save the city from destruction, only themselves. Okay, folks, I'm not surprised that Ezekiel knows about Noah. I'm not surprised that Ezekiel knows about Job. But Daniel is his contemporary, and God is already <clears throat> exalting Daniel's status, showing how great he is, that as great as he is, he's still not great enough to save Jerusalem from destruction. But wait, God, Ezekiel and Daniel are contemporaries. Yeah. Noah and Job came before, yes. But Daniel's a contemporary, yes. And he's already attained, quote-unquote, legendary status. Daniel has already attained a status in the eyes of the people where they, they are aware he is so highly exalted and honored by God that Ezekiel can use him as an example. Ezekiel 14, verse 20. It's not the issue of anything bad being said about him. It's the fact that Ezekiel is a contemporary and knows that Daniel is already highly exalted in the sight of heaven. Ezekiel 14, 20. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord Jehovah, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Again, if Noah was in Jerusalem, if Job was in Jerusalem, they would only spare their lives because the city has to be destroyed. But then he mentions Daniel and that company. Thank you, Guy Wilkerson. Side note, this shows you that Job is a true historical person, highly honored by God, loved by God. And you know what's ironic, folks? Job is the very individual that God said to Satan and the angels, there's no one like him in all the earth who fears me and still maintains his integrity. And Noah is the individual that Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 and 9 Particularly verse 9 tells us that he was perfect in his all, all his generations and righteous in all the earth. And who's now grouped with them? Daniel. Sink it in. Same level as Noah and Job. Come on, Charles. You're hurting me. 
Why would you think Job is just a story when even James uses him as an illustration of patience through suffering? After the flood, Attila. He would have been after the flood. Now, the third reference to Daniel in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28, verse 3. Ezekiel 28, verse 3. Ezekiel 28, verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, and God is mocking the king of Tyre. This is mockery. He's saying, you are so great, you're wiser than Daniel. But hold on, I'm confused. Daniel was functioning as the chief of the astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans in the king's palace in Babylon, in Iraq, at this time when Ezekiel uttered this oracle against the king of Tyre. And already at the time of Ezekiel, Daniel's wisdom has reached legendary status so that if you want to be considered wise, you'd be compared to Daniel. To give you a modern example, dude, you're better than Bruce Lee in Kung Fu. Even Bruce Lee's not as good as you. That would be praise, wouldn't it? Because Bruce Lee's considered the standard of Kung Fu fighting. To say you're just as good better means you're legendary. And so that's what God is saying to the king of Tyre. Man, you are so wise, you're wiser than Daniel. But he's mocking him because king of Tyre is a pagan whom he's about to destroy and kill. It's, Lee, it's like me mocking first last. First last, man, you're so good. You're even better than Bruce Lee. <laughs> And you know I'm lying. Or even worse, man, Chuck is as good as Bruce. You know that's a lie. You know I'm mocking. Right? You get my point? So, guys, did you catch how Ezekiel is already acknowledging, he's already aware, and he's affirming the greatness of Daniel in the sight of God? And they're contemporaries. And they both live in Babylon. One among the common folk in the Chabar River, Kebar River, and the other in the king's palace. And then Daniel recognizes that Jeremiah is a prophet who wrote down the prophecies that God gave him. Three contemporaries. And don't forget that Ezekiel affirms the historicity of Noah and Job. They're just as real as Daniel is. So if Noah and Job are not historical characters, but fictional characters, so is Daniel. Right? Oh, but let me tell you, two other prophets mentioned by Jeremiah in order to highlight how great these prophets were in the sight of God. We saw Noah and Job. Go to Jeremiah 15, verse 1. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. I hope this is sinking in because I'm going to have to do a part two to this session. Jeremiah, I don't know why you're going to Ezekiel, brother. Yeah, I think I have to stone you. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Shamir, that would call for a block. Who would be stupid enough besides liberals to say that Ezekiel would be praising a pagan mythological character named Dan El, who was a worshiper of gods and goddesses and putting Dan El on the level of Noah and Job. Only an imbecile, liberal, Bible-denying heretic. Why would you then repeat that nonsense, that blasphemy? I was anticipating someone bring it up, but I didn't think Shamir would be that stupid to do it. Folks, follow the stupidity here. In the Ugaritic text, we, we discover a figure named Daniel. Daniel, a pagan worshiper of gods and goddesses, and liberal critics say that's who Ezekiel's referring to. Do you really think Ezekiel would mention a pagan, a mythological pagan figure? from a pagan text and put him on the level of Noah and Job. You would rather agree with me? Now, Shamir, I'm not trying to talk down to you, but 
You don't need to be an Einstein to see the stupidity of that. Now, that's why I'm going to ask again, and please, brothers, sisters, don't be upset with me when I deal with people like this harshly. How stupid must you be to think that this needs a refutation? You see, Christians, no PhDs here, no one's gone to seminary or college, automatically they spotted how stupid this claim is. Folks, without going to seminary or having a PhD, how stupid did it sound to your ears that Ezekiel may have been referring to a mythological character, some figure from a pagan text, Ugaritic text, who was a worshiper of gods and goddesses? Why would Ezekiel mention that figure as an example that even the righteous cannot spare Jerusalem from destruction? In what way would that figure qualify as being righteous in the sight of God? Do you guys spot how stupid that was? The liberals did. Liberal critical scholars, Bible-denying heretics who claim to be scholars because they could not accept Ezekiel referencing Daniel in the 6th century. Do you know why, Medic, why they couldn't accept it? Because for the liberals, Daniel is not a 6th century B.C. character. Liberal scholars believe Daniel is a work of fiction that was produced in the 2nd century B.C., but whoever produced it projected back in the 6th century a figure called Daniel who did not exist at that time. So Ezekiel could not be referring to Daniel as a contemporary if Daniel did not exist. So Ezekiel must have been referring to some distant mythological pagan character named Daniel from a pagan source, Ugaritic text, as an example of righteousness. Really? And notice what Shamir said. He said he just read it in his notes on the Bible. What notes to which Bible produced by whom exactly? Yes, Attila. They found a copy of Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But do you think that's going to stop them from positing Daniel as a second century work of fiction? So, Shamir, what Bible are you reading? Okay, ESV. Now, did ESV study note also refute it? Because if the ESV study Bible told you that this may be referring to this mythological character from a text in Ugarit, who was a pagan and could not be an example of righteousness, if they didn't refute it, throw your study Bible out the window. Did they tell you that can't be the one? That Dan Ezekiel cannot be referring to that Daniel? You want me there? Shamir? I don't want to waste too much time on this. In your note, did you read it carefully and did they refute that? Right, I, I already knew about this figure. And thank the Lord for conservative scholars who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, like Gleason L. Archer, who provides a thorough refutation of that nonsense, that silly, if not blasphemous theory. I read about that figure in Gleason Archer, and he refuted it, as did others. As have others. Shamir, I'm waiting for your response. We're wasting time here. Does the ESV study note refute it? Thank you, Fisherman. God bless you. Now, you can ask sincere questions about the topic. Okay, now notice Shamir just read his own study Bible saying there is no conclusive evidence that it's someone other than the prophet Daniel, and that wasn't good enough for you, and you had to mention this other figure. Why would you do that, Shamir? Your own Bible told you this theory is nonsense. There is no evidence showing it's other than the prophet Daniel. So then why would you raise it up? Now, I want to know what your reason was for raising it up. 
Why then would you repeat a lie that's refuted in your note? Unless it's to try to sound intelligent or to distract. What was your motive? Why did you repeat it? You're wasting my time, Shamir. Come on. And people get upset at me saying, why do I do what I do? What's the point in mentioning a theory postulated by liberals who don't believe in the Bible's historical accuracy, let alone its inspiration, a theory that's so nonsensical that someone blind can see how foolish a theory is that Ezekiel's going to mention a pagan mythological character of the past who is depicted as a worshiper of gods and goddesses, anything but an example of piety, and use him as an example that if such a figure was in Babylon, I'm sorry, in Jerusalem, he too wouldn't be righteous enough to spare Jerusalem. Of course, he's wicked. All right. Did you hear that part? Of course. It's nonsense because it's wicked. How can a wicked pagan character from a pagan source be an example of a man that, though righteous, would still be incapable of sparing Jerusalem from being destroyed? I don't get it. Sorry, folks. You Sometimes I go on tangents, not because I want to, because I can't understand. Is this really the dumbing down of Christians? Honestly, I'm asking an honest question. You don't need to be Einstein or have a PhD to see how silly this objection is. Who in their right mind would think a prophet like Ezekiel, who condemns the worship of gods and goddesses all throughout his book, would then prop up a mythical pagan character a worshiper of the gods and goddesses as an example of a person that's righteous but not so righteous enough to spare Jerusalem from being destroyed. Are we really, really, honestly, that stupid, that biblically illiterate, that we cannot see, that even to raise this as a possibility is to show the futility, the foolishness of this argument? Honestly, don't be upset at me that I'm getting frustrated. I mean, come on, let's be honest, Christians. You're going to tell me that Ezekiel is going to point to this mythical character that even in those sources is a pagan and a worshiper of gods and goddesses as illustration saying, hey, Jerusalem, even if such a person was living in your midst, he still wouldn't be able to spare God from destroying you. Of course he couldn't. He's wicked too. He's a pagan. He'd be destroyed with them. Wow. Really? Does that make sense, folks? Honestly? Does that make sense? Why would you need me to refute it? Why would you need... Here, let me give you an example. Someone today, a Christian author, writes a book and says, Look, man, even if the Apostle Paul was here, or... Daniel was here and Muhammad was here in America. They still wouldn't be able to spare America from being destroyed by God. Let me repeat again the example. This is what this guy just told me. Even if the Apostle Paul was living in America, along with Daniel and Muhammad, they still wouldn't be able to spare America from being destroyed. What's wrong with that statement? What's wrong with that statement coming from a Christian who knows that Muhammad is an antichrist? a false prophet, a son of Satan, an immoral pervert, a pedophile who whored women, right, in the name of temporary marriage, had married women raped when taken captive, and I put him in the same company of Paul and Daniel as an illustration of righteousness? That's what you're doing when you tell me Ezekiel's mentioning Noah and Job and this pagan character named Daniel from a pagan text, a Ugaritic text that worshipped the gods and goddesses, worshipped Il and Il's 70 sons, one of whom was Baal, Il who used to have sexual orgies with the goddesses. 
And this is who Ezekiel is propping up as an example of righteousness. Really? You hear me there? You understand why I get upset when Christians can't refute something so simple like this? You know how easy it is to refute this? Right? So please don't ever tell me, Shamir, because I'm going to block you if you do it again. Oh, but my note says that it's not certain if this is Daniel or Daniel from the Ugaritic text. And not tell me that your own text told you there is no conclusive evidence that this is someone other than Prophet Daniel. And you left that part out and had me go on a 10-minute tangent to correct something that should be so clear cannot be true. Everyone with me there? Now, coming back to the issue, did you get what we read in Ezekiel? Ezekiel mentions Noah, Job, and Daniel as three examples of outstanding, pious, righteous, God-fearing men whom God blessed and used and spoke to and through. Three. One of whom happens to be his contemporary, Ezekiel Daniel contemporary, showing that Daniel, even at that time, had attained, quote-unquote, legendary status, even though I don't like to use the word legendary, right? And then the prophet Jeremiah has a book that a scribe wrote down for him. And what the scribe Berechiah wrote on behalf of Jeremiah are the very words, revelations that the Word of God gave to Jeremiah and a copy of that book has reached Daniel in Babylon, who is Jeremiah's contemporary. And Daniel realizes that prophet, Jeremiah, is receiving revelation from God. And I need to study his work. And then Daniel also has other books written by other prophets, such as the Law of Moses. Don't forget those two points, right? You got that? But now let's go to Jeremiah and see whom Jeremiah mentions. Notice Ezekiel said that if Noah, Job, and Daniel were in Jerusalem. Now, how accurate is Ezekiel in that Daniel wasn't in Jerusalem, he was in Babylon. But he's saying if Daniel was in Jerusalem, he'd only save himself because God is determined to destroy Jerusalem. He's fed up. And Jeremiah confirms what Ezekiel says. And now notice Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are contemporaries. Three prophets that wrote prophetic writings by inspiration, all prophesying during the same time period, roughly. Jeremiah in Jerusalem, Ezekiel and Daniel in Babylon, in Iraq, Ezekiel with the common people, Daniel in the king's palace. Now, Jeremiah 15, verse 1. In agreement with Ezekiel, in agreement with Ezekiel, even if these outstanding righteous prophets whom God loved were here, they wouldn't stop God from destroying Jerusalem. That's how sick and fed up he is with Jerusalem. Because notice Jeremiah 15 verse 1. Then said Jehovah unto me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me. Wow. Yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight. Let them go forth. Wow. <whistles> Jerusalem had reached a point of no return. God was so fed up with them, so disgusted with them, that he mentions two people, two people, Close to his heart, that if they were here before me interceding, they still would not stop me from destroying this place. Because don't forget, in Exodus 32, Moses interceded to stop God from destroying the Israelites in the desert. And God accepted his intercession. He goes, Okay, I won't destroy them for your sake. He goes, But if Moses were to try to do it now, I wouldn't accept his intercession. I'd spare him, but destroy everyone else. This time, his intercession would not work. Are you catching it? Jeremiah Ezekiel mentioned great prophetic figures of the past. Moses. Job. Noah. Samuel. That means Ezekiel, Jeremiah, were aware of these figures, that they're historical figures who existed, and they were greatly used by God. They knew that 
because of the revelation from God, and they knew that because of the prophetic books that they read. So not only do they know that by revelation of God, because God is making it known to them, but the fact that God is mentioning them shows that God is aware that they know who these figures are because they've read about them in the prophetic writings. Is this all making sense? Is this sinking in making sense? Before I move on, so I'm going to obviously do a part two on this, obviously. Okay. Amazing, right? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, mention Noah, Job, <clears throat> Moses, and Samuel. Which means that God, in mentioning them, knows that they already know about these individuals, how great they were in his sight, and use them to show how disgusted, how fed up he is with the Jews in Jerusalem that even these figures could not spare you from destruction. Even these figures could not appease me to stop me from destroying you. That's how wicked you are. So they're not even righteous enough to stop me from destroying you for your wickedness. They're not righteous enough to appease me. But one was righteous enough to do so, Jesus Christ. And now you tie it in with the glory of Christ. You understand now? As great as these men were, as righteous as they were, they were not righteous enough to appease me, to stop me from destroying you for your wicked sin and persistent blasphemy. They'd only be able to spare themselves. Unlike Jesus, whose death completely satisfies God, completely propitiates God's anger, removes his anger and satisfies him to the umpteenth degree, to the infinite degree, that if you turn to Christ and trust in him, God will never say, not good enough. Did you catch it now? So as great as they were, they were not good enough to spare you from my wrath. But Jesus was, and is, and ever shall be. Jesus was, and is, and ever shall be. Okay? Let me show you the power of Moses' intercession. And we're going to do a part two on this. Okay? Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Exodus 32. Exodus 32, 10 to 14. Exodus 32, 10 to 14. Why does God want to destroy the Israelites in the desert? Because they have built golden calves and they're saying, Behold your gods, O Israel. So God says to Moses, notice what he says to Moses. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought Jehovah his God, and said, Jehovah, Yehovah, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak? Why should the Egyptians say, for mischief did he bring them out and to slay them? Why should the Egyptians mock you and say, you only brought them out to destroy them? Why would you let them say that about you, God? to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Notice his intercession. Don't let the Egyptians mock you, saying you brought them out only to destroy them because you're wicked. And remember your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're a good God, a faithful God. You love them. You love the patriarchs. You love Abraham, Isaac, and, ja and Jacob. Thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And Jehovah repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Bam! Do you see the power of the intercession of Moses? Did you catch it? Do you see the power of his intercession? And see his appeal? Don't give the Egyptians, unbelievers, a chance to mock you and question your, your perfect character and judgment. 
Because if you bring them out of Egypt to destroy them in the desert, they'll say, you see, what a wicked God. He had no intention in blessing them. He just wanted to destroy them. Or what a powerless God. He brought them out of Egypt, but he wasn't powerful enough to sustain them. Don't let them shame you, God. Show the Egyptians who you are, that you are truly God, not their gods. And also notice his appeal. And remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants. Abraham, your friend, how much they loved you and how much you love them. You're their God. They're your people. Don't do this to their seed. You love them. They loved you. And God says, all right, I won't. This, this brings in another point that many Protestant evangelicals are either unaware of or don't want to accept. Let me repeat this, because as an evangelical, I try to ignore this facet of salvation. Okay, Are you aware that God does take into consideration your intimacy, your obedience, your love, and your righteousness? In blessing someone else, either with healing or with salvation? Did you know that? That's biblical? That's tied in with Jesus' death and perfect life of obedience? That God will take into account your love for him, your love for Jesus, your devotion to Jesus, your sacrifice for Jesus, your obedience to Jesus. He takes that into account. To bless others because of you and your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. Are you guys listening? Let this sink in. Let me give you another example from the New Testament. Mark chapter 2 verse 5. Let's read Mark 2 verses 1 to 5. Vine, I hope this is blessing you too. Mark 2 verses 1 to 5, but pay attention to 5. And again, he entered into Capernaum. After some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So four people carried this paralytic on his mallet, on his pallet, on his mat. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof, where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay, the paralytic ray. Now notice this. Notice what it did not say. When Jesus saw his faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So Jesus forgave this man because of their collective faith. And how did he see their faith? By their deeds, their actions. Nothing stopped them from bringing their friend to Jesus. Not even a crowd, not even a roof. They tore the roof. They damaged the property of someone else just to get to Jesus. That's how much faith and confidence they had. Jesus had the power to heal him. Did it sink in? So what you're learning from Moses' example, the example of the four men who brought their paralytic friend, and these two other examples, God does take into account consideration the righteousness, the obedience, the worship, the piety, the intimacy of his servants in blessing others for their sake on the basis of the work of Jesus. Not in spite of Jesus' work, in union and connection to Jesus' work. Right? Let me give you another example. Romans 11, 28 to 29. Romans 11, 28 to 29. We're going to do another session on the Magi and the Christmas story. Magi and the Christmas story. Now notice here. As concerning the gospel, the Israelites, they are enemies for your sakes. As far as the preaching the gospel is concerned, Israel has become enemies, right? Enemies of God, so that now God can focus on the Gentiles. Now that they've rejected God, he's going to focus on the Gentiles. But now notice the second part. But as touching the election, 
that they've been elected and set apart. They are beloved for the father's sakes. Wait, 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 wait. God still loves them for the sake of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Meaning, when God calls you and gives you a gift, it's irrevocable. He does not go back on his promise to you. And it's talking about the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob he would save their seed. And he'll never lie or break his word because of his love for them. And for his love for them, he will not completely be done with Israel. Not completely. But for whose sake? The sake of their fathers. It's right there in your face. So don't tell me God doesn't bless someone because of the righteousness of another or the prayers of another or the intimate communion of another. He actually absolutely does so. Are you catching it? But this then opens the door for the topics I discussed in depth in previous sessions. I did about six of them. So then that means believers close to God, believers after God's heart, can make an impact through their prayers and petitions for you. Thank you. I love this passage. 1 Peter 3.12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open up to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Right? You guys see that? Another example. Job 42.7-10. to 10. Job 42.7-10. to 10. We're going to tie it in together, and I'm going to do a part two on the Magi. Job 42.7-10. And it was so that after Job had spoken these words unto Job, Jehovah said, Yehovah said, Yahweh said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled, kindled against thee. My anger is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken to me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Right? Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks. Notice how God's going to forgive them, folks. Pay attention. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, seven bulls and seven rams, 14, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that ye have not spoken to me the thing which is right like my servant Job. If he prays for you after you offer these burnt offerings, I will accept his intercession, and I won't destroy you as you deserve. Now notice 9 and 10. 9 and 10. So Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Nemethite went and did according as Yehovah, Jehovah commanded them. And Jehovah also accepted Job. And Jehovah, Yehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also Yehovah, Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, did you catch it? Notice God said, you'll only be forgiven on the basis of sacrifice, a burnt offering to atone for your sins and the intercession of Job. If Job doesn't pray for you, I won't accept you. Notice God is saying, for the sake of Job's prayer and the burnt offering, will you be accepted and forgiven? As a picture of Christ who intercedes for us and offers himself as a burnt offering to procure our redemption. Yep, Job is a picture of Christ. Moses is a picture of Christ. And that he's interceding. God, don't punish these sinners. And don't treat them according to their wickedness. Forgive them. And here's a sacrifice for their sin. And God says, I accept that sacrifice for your sake, Job, on the basis of your intercession. Why even do that? Why did God even waste Why not God just say, hey, I'll forgive you if you just pray to me. God makes it complicated, doesn't he? He doesn't say to them, pray to me. No, no, no. He has to pray for you after you offered his burnt offering, and then I'll accept his prayer and forgive you. See, God is showing you how he operates because it's a picture of Christ. I will accept the intercessory prayers of the righteous close to my heart and your sacrifice for sin in order to save you and not condemn you. God is showing you this is how he's chosen to operate. He'll take in your prayers, 
your intercessions, provided you're walking closely to God in union with the Spirit and doing all you can to mortify the flesh, right? And he'll take your deeds, your intercessions, your prayers, your mediation into account to bless others connected to you. Yes, Jonathan Simon, Genesis chapter 20, verse 6 to 7. Another example, another example, Jonathan Simon, Genesis 20, verses 6 to 7. All of this pointing to Christ and the cross. They are pictures of Christ, our mediator, and these burnt offerings are a picture of him offering himself as a sacrifice that God accepts for the sake of Christ, on behalf of Christ, on the basis of Christ's mediation. Here, Genesis 20, 6 to 7. Let's read. And God said unto him, Abimelech, who was about to sleep with Sarah, thinking Sarah was Abraham's sister, not knowing she was also his wife. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. You didn't know that she was a married woman. Right? Now, therefore, restore the man. Oh, I'm sorry. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. So I stopped you from sinning against me by sleeping with this married woman. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. I didn't let you touch her. Now notice seven. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. Notice he has to pray for you, my prophet, and you will live. And because of his prayer, I won't kill you dead. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Did you catch it? Abraham, my prophet, must pray for you, and I won't kill you. If he doesn't pray, you're as good as dead. Job has to pray for you guys, and I won't kill you. If he doesn't pray, you're as good as dead. Moses interceded before God, appeased God, and which is why the Israelites did not die. But when Moses appeased God, he didn't simply appease him by his prayers. Notice Exodus 32.30. Exodus 32.30. Yep, Medic, the bronze serpent. Exodus 32, 30. And it came to pass on morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I'll go up to Jehovah. Perhaps, peradventure means perhaps, I shall make an atonement for your sin. Do you see the connection? Atonement for sin and intercession. Burnt offering for sin and intercession. Intercession. Mediation and atoning sacrifices. Mediation and atonement. Intercession and propitiatory sacrifice. They both that must be present, go hand in hand, and bringing about salvation. Sink it in, folks. Bronze serpent, numbers 21, 4 to 9. Start at 4. You see the pattern in the Old Testament. Mediation, intercession, sacrifice. Mediation, intercession, burnt offering. Mediation, intercession, atonement for sin. They must be present. They must go hand in hand to bring about forgiveness. So don't let anyone tell you God doesn't save, doesn't bless, doesn't forgive for the sake of another, on behalf of another who's close to his heart, who is dear to his heart, whom he loves and adores. Clear? So now that you saw this, now that you saw this, let's look at Jeremiah 15 verse 1 one more time. One more time. Jeremiah 15 verse 1 one more time. Yes, you can, Jonathan. Of course you can. You can ask the Lord to pray to the Father, and you can ask the Lord directly. Of course, he's your mediator between, a mediator before the Father. Of course you can. Okay. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. Then said Jehovah unto me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Did you guys catch it? You understand how wicked and evil Israel had become? That as great as Moses was, and he turned God's wrath against Israelites, God says if he tried to do it now for this generation, he would fail. Though he is righteous, he's not righteous enough to stop me from destroying them. You catch it? 
Now you understand the gravity of their sin. They had sinned to such an extent that God was so fed up and disgusted with them. He says, I'm sorry, Moses. Even if you were to pray right now or if Samuel intercede right now, I would save you but would not save them because your righteousness is not righteous enough to spare me from destroying this people. Right? Ezekiel 14, 14. Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, say Jehovah God. Notice who he says, the same Job that God said had to pray for his three friends after they offered a burnt offering for them to be forgiven. And God says, if Job were to do that today, intercede and pray for any Israelite, he would be spared, no one else, because his prayer, his intimacy with me is not good enough to stop me from destroying the Jews in Jerusalem and their temple. And notice, it's speaking of the same group of Jews living at the same time that Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah 15.1 and Ezekiel wrote Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel and Jeremiah are talking about the same Jews and the same Jerusalem in the 6th century B.C. Does this, this, this did all sink in? Did it all make sense? Did it all make sense? Did it all sink in? God willing, before Christmas, Lord willing, I'll try to do another session. We're going to go deeper into the Christmas story, more on the Magi, more on what Christmas is all about. But now, don't forget, the Magi knew a lot more about Jesus than most people realize or think because we only read surface level. We need to ask the Holy Spirit, seek the face of the Holy Spirit, help me to plumb the depth of your word. Help me to know what the word means and give me the power to love your word and live your word for the glory of Jesus. Because if you dig deeper into Matthew 2, you'll see they're called magi for a reason. Because the word magi is the word that the Greek translation of the Old Testament of Daniel uses for the astrologers that Daniel ruled over because of his great stature and recognition of being a man, receiving revelations from the true God, knowing mysteries and their interpretation because of the Spirit of God in him that none of them knew because they realized their gods were not the revealers of mysteries, but only Daniel's God. So those were the Magi under the authority of Daniel, whom Daniel would have taught, whom Daniel would have instructed, whom Daniel preached to about the true God, the true religion, and the coming king as the God-man. And so the Magi, Matthew 2, are the spiritual descendants of the Magi of the time of Daniel, which is why they knew so much about the child. They knew the child is not only the king of Israel. They knew the child is God Almighty in the flesh, the God-babe, born to rule. And they knew the child would die and they knew the child was worthy of worship. And Lord willing, I'll unpack it more in the second session, God willing. And we'll talk more about the star. Was the star a shining object in space? Perhaps. God can do that. He's almighty. Or was it an angelic creature, right, luminescent, appearing luminously as a shining object? Lord willing, we'll talk about it more in the next session. I don't know when the next session will be. If I can do one tomorrow, Saturday, I will. If not, I'll do Sunday. But pray for me, folks, because next week is going to be super hard. I am aching, dying for my two babies, my gifts from Jesus, my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old, Sarai and Zipporah. I ache for them. I miss them. I cannot wait to kiss them and hug them and love them and love bomb them, flood them in my love. If that's ever going to happen, the Lord knows. If it is going to happen, pray sooner than later. This will be the third year without my angels. So though you'll be celebrating, I pray you celebrate the true reason for the season, the birth of the god man. And like the wise men, the magi, worship him, not just on Christmas, but every day, because Christmas is every day for the believer. Worship him, love him, trust in him. 
And as you see your children, be thankful to God that you can have the grace of celebrating with your children. Because let me tell you, there are people right now as we speak who are homeless or have no children or have no parents, even kids who are orphaned, who will be celebrating Christmas, not with their parents, not with their children, but with others. So think of them. Pray for them. And ask God to flood them, flood me and my daughters in his infinite love, compassion to cover us by the blood of Jesus. And guys, if you believe God has called me into ministry, I need more supporters to stand up with me. Lord willing, in time, I'm going to change my Patreon account and name. And I hope that those who are contributing now will continue to contribute in my new account because I have to make changes to protect myself by the grace of God. So pray for my success. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And I love you for the sake of Jesus. Lord willing, see you before Christmas.